Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, Weekend Warriors to you for Monday, December 17th, 2018. And welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that is by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. Crazy as ever, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, sane as ever, Paul Kent. <laughs> good for you. At least that makes one of us. That's good. That's good. Not too much phases me these days, brother. That's good. That's good. Yeah. It's just busy this time of year. You know? It is busy this time of year. Yeah. You, uh, uh, total gigs, total time on a stage this this month. How many things are you... Are you on, how many times are you on stage? See, so the fact that you asked me that reminds me that the folks that are doing that Hedwig show started begging me to do it because they can't find another drummer. <laughs> <laughs> so even though you had a very polite dissolution of your relationship, you're coming back around again. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like there was no F you part of this. It was like, you want more out of me than I can give you. And, you know, and what's happened, of course, is they've looked and time has elapsed and I haven't worried about it. You know, because I don't have the time to give them anyway. So uh, so now we're coming down to like the time that I could give them. So I'm going to have a conversation with them about compensation and see what um, see if we can make sure everybody gets taken care of on this gig. If Sounds like the leverage has, uh, has shifted dramatically in the meantime. Right? Dramatically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, that's, so uh, this month, gosh, I don't even have my calendar up, but um but I've been on stage a lot this month. I had two gigs last week. I had a madhouse, which was, uh, which was a blast. We, um, you know, this one, a, a lot of times I'll, and, and, and true for this one too, I'll get the song list well in advance and I'll start really prepping or whatever with this one. I just didn't have time. So it was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll prep for it on Monday. We have a rehearsal on Tuesday and then we have the gig Wednesday. And that, and that was enough time. And the tunes for this one, there were enough tunes that I knew, coming in and then some that I had to chart, but you know, I've kind of figured that out. We have a great band with Madhouse now, so I don't have to feel like I don't need to worry about anybody else on stage. Right. I know they're all going to prep and, and do their work. So it was really kind of relaxed and I mean, relaxed as Madhouse can be and fun. And, um, and it wouldn't be a Madhouse if it was relaxed. Right? Correct. Yes, it was, but it was fun. Right. Hence the name. Hence the name. But, um, you know, they, they, it, it's interesting, right? I'll get the the script, which has the songs in it, in their flow, and it shows where the cuts are, because we don't do the entirety of every song. We'll do like a verse and a chorus or, you know, whatever fits the the story, and then we're out. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there's a Spotify playlist that comes along with it, right? And and so so I know which, ver we all know which versions to, to you know, to, to look at. And we did an interesting, I forget who did it. We did an interesting version of, of uh, Radiohead's Creep, that sounded, it had that, that six, eight groove, like everybody hurts, you know? Uh, so I called it everybody creeps, but it was, you know, so there's these different versions of these tunes that we do, whatever. And I, you know, looking at the thing and, and this storyline was that the, the two of the crazy characters in Madhouse had a child and this child had these magical powers and blows up the world at the end of, of Madhouse, which is the end of our second season of Madhouse. So it, you know, it leaves a little cliffhanger hanger or whatever. And uh, and then the last song that we play, like a, as the world is blowing up, is the Beatles' "Helter Skelter." I'm like, okay, cool, right, great, no problem. Like, we know this tune, no problem. And then I noticed on the Spotify playlist was a cover of REM's "End of the World as We Know It," but it wasn't in the script. So I sent a note out saying, "Are we playing this? Is it just going to be played over the PA, or you know, what's the deal?" And it, I, I got no note back. But this was like Monday. I sent this note out. So Tuesday we're at rehearsal going through stuff. I'm like, so what's the deal with end of the world? And they're like, Oh, right. So, you know, the world blows up. We were, you know, everybody's on, we invite the audience on stage for Helter Skelter. And then, uh, you know, we were going to have that be like the beginning of, of the exit music or, you know, whatever if people want to dance on stage or whatever they can, that's fine. And they said, but if you guys want to play it, that's great. They said, the big problem of course, is that no one in the cast knows the, the lyrics <laughs> for that tune. 
And so, you know, we don't have anybody to sing it. I'm like, you forget, <laughs> you forget, you have, you know, you have Dave here. Dave's learned this song because Dave is a huge REM fan. So, uh, so we wound up doing uh, End of the World as We Know It at the, uh, at the end of the gig. That's a weird tune, you know. It is. Well, there's a freaking lot of words to it. And the thing is, if I'm not thinking about it, they just flow right out. So when we, re- when we rehearsed it on Tuesday, it was no problem. It was like, oh, yeah, great. Everybody's looking at me and laughing like, holy crap, how do you know all these words? It's like, I, don't ask. Like, they're there. Don't mess with it. But then the problem is I had 24 hours to, before I had to do it again. And like the words, you know, are swimming around in my head and getting all jumbled up. And I'm like, no, stop thinking about it. Just like let it happen and it'll be fine. If you think too much, you're never going to get it right. You know, because if I have to stop and think about what the next word is, it's over. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, thank- funny, I made talking it through, about those lyrics. So, yeah. Talking about those lyrics, I actually have a, a resolution to figure out a better science to memorizing lyrics. I am, especially in my acoustic life. I've got, I've got 50 songs that are 60% done. The music is all the way done, but it's just committing lyrics to memory that, and usually I get so far and then I do it and then I get bored and I move on to another, I got to get a little bit more discipline in finishing a song when I'm preparing it for the acoustic shows. But I, there's got to be some science to understanding how to memorize lyrics better, especially as you get older. And so I've been reading a bunch of stuff, watching a bunch of videos and stuff. And they all, you know, they kind of say the same things. You know, there's four or five techniques that seem to come up over again. Obviously, one is just constant repetition. Right, right. Uh, That's not two, enough, though. That's not enough no, for me. Right. It's not enough. It, and you, it seems almost like you get a little fatigue from it, then your brain kind of locks you out from it. So it, it seems to... Um, but this technique about stacking the lyrics. So first... Learn the first line of each yes. section. Yes. Right. Yep. And it's actually quite interesting that once you do that, you'd be surprised how much of what you do know is will come out better. Right. I, actually, that's that's one of my issues with singing "End of the World." Is I know all the lyrics I, for the life of me. I've gotten it to where now I know the start of the second verse. The beginning of the song is no problem. Second verse, I now know the first line, and then it, like you said, it follows from there. I, at this moment, I could not tell you what the beginning of the third verse is, so, but as long as I have it and I did, I just, I had it on a page. I could look down and was like, Oh, there's the beginning of the third verse. Fine. And then the rest of the lyrics all just flow right out. It's all good to go. Yeah. 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 And then the, the next technique is this concept of stacking. So you learn the first line and you just do it over and over again. And then you do the first and second line uh-huh. and you do it over and over again. And you do the first, and second, and third line and you do it over and over and over again. And that, and just that though. Right. And so that seems like it works pretty good. They, you know, they said having it, a lot of the things I read, having uh, cues around you in many places seems to help the things that are natural to me. Like, you know, I'll take, I'll take the lyrics and w- the part that I can't constantly forget, I'll like highlight them or try and study those. That doesn't seem to work and lock it in. You have to have, you have to have context in order to kind of lock the whole story in. And, uh, so this this concept of stacking seems to work best so far for me, but I'm really going to work on it over the holidays and really try and make some headway with the, you know, the songs that, like I said, I'm 60% done on and I want to get over the finish line. You know, I'm going to see what I can do because there's there's a ton of them. You know? Yeah. And uh, well, I, 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 the, I was... the music, the music is re- repetitive and the music seems to stick way easier. And something about your fingers to your ears, to your brain seems to be a much more holistic process. Yeah. But lyrics. Not so much. It's hard. It's hard. I, you know, I was thinking about it actually a lot this week because of this end of the world thing. I'm like, how do is it that I, you know, it's whatever, 20 years later, I still know 30 years later, I still know all those lyrics. No problem. But you know, there are songs that I just can't learn. I'm usually pretty good at just letting things happen. And then I know them, but there's a few songs where I, I, I just can't do it. And, uh, feeling all right from traffic or, you know, Dave oh. Mason or whatever. It like it doesn't make any sense. There's no story there, so like there's nothing to remind me of. It's just a bunch of weird little rhymes that that sort of are all related. The and, worst for that, Dave. Yeah, come together. Ah, uh, you know it's funny. I that's the other one that that I was going to no mention. There's no story. Right, right. I happen to be better with that. I've been singing the harmonies on that one for a long time. So if I stop thinking. And I just let the words come out and I can do come together. But if I'm, if I, like, if you were to ask me, so what's the second verse? Well, I don't know. You know. Um, 
it, but but it's the same kind of thing, you know, and I and I started thinking about it like, OK, well, how did I learn the lyrics for End of the World as we know it? It's like, well, you know what I did is I there were no printed lyrics for this at the time. Right. One of the big one of the first big projects on the Internet pre web. It was this was like in the gopher days that I stumbled across and contributed to and and found was this REM lyric compilation because no one knew the words for REM's lyrics, including Michael Stipe in some cases, right? Because it's just all this stream of consciousness stuff. And uh and and so uh it, you know that but I learned these lyrics prior to that existing. And so it was well, you know, I sat there with the with the CD or the tape or whatever and I would listen to a passage and okay, great. And and write it down. And that process of like immersing in it to not only learn what they are and or not to memorize what they are, but also to just learn what they are really made that process like it's so, it was automatic. Right. Where by the time you're done, you already know half the lyrics you've got to memorize because you've been mm. pouring through this for so long now that we can just go online and say, OK, you know, R.E.M. End of the World is your Beatles come together. Boom. There they are. Here come old flat top, you know, and you're just reading these words without learning them as they exist in the song, I think that's my biggest problem because I feeling all right was one I never learned, you know, up until just a couple of years ago when the guys in Fling were like, we need to do it. And it was, I was nominated to sing it. It's like, okay, cool. So I just, you know, in rehearsal, I did what you always do. I grabbed my iPad and I pulled up the lyrics and I sang it. And then that's, you're dead because <laughs> it's they're right there. You didn't do any work. There's no process to get them there. Somebody else did the work and listened and pulled them. And I, I think that's, that's to me, uh, it, if, if I need to like, and that's probably what I should do with feeling. All right. is just forget the, the fact that I have them written somewhere else, sit down with the song, listen, pause, write, resume, you know, listen, pause, write, resume, and go through that process. And my guess is by the end of it, I'll be it'll way. Lock. Yeah. It'll lock them in. Yeah. I think Definitely so. It seems like it gets harder as we get older. I mean, if you think about the songs that you could just sing all day long when you were in high school, right. it definitely seems like something changes. Well, also our brains, section. our brains right. no longer memorize as well as they might have once. Clearly. Done. So <laughs> Obviously. It's possible. It's a flaw with nature, Paul, is yeah. what it is. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, among many. <laughs> among many. Yes. At yes. least with me. <laughs> hey, I got something cool to share with you. I, I was at a fun party on Christmas party on Saturday night, ran into a buddy of mine who actually is a gig gab listener. Cool. And um, we were just talking about stuff and, you know, he's a musician and um, he was talking about how his band has this kind of um, push and pull going right now. Like the guy who founded the band and I think the two guys who are the main songwriters, so it's a, it's a original band. They want to get out there and play, you know, in a larger geography than local. And he has a day job and a family and, you know, other things going on. And, and you know, he's not as into that. And he's kind of shared with them, you know, if you want to do that, you know, I just want to let you know, I can't do it. And I'm totally cool, you know, if you want to make another arrangement when you do that. But it kind of brings to mind these conversations we have every several episodes about kind of like rule one for a successful band is people should be on the same page. Yes. And if you want to, you know, if you're, if you, success is continuity. I mean, again, success can be measured in many, many ways, but yeah. if one of the ways you want to ensure success and not have to go through the headaches of subbing and not have to go the headaches of, you know, creating a bench and, you know, going deeper into your bench for different gigs, you know, the concept of, you know, having frank discussions when you form a band, when you bring someone into a band, you know, that the goals, you know, in many ways, how many times a month do you want to play? How far away are you willing to drive for gigs is, is a really interesting question. How much are you into covers versus original? Yep. Lots of questions to go into that. But the point being that, and, and it's a funny thing because if you're a leader of a band or if it's a democracy and the band is doing this as a collective hive brain, yeah. you know, the ability to decipher someone's ability to answer. So I, I know from personal experience, I've hired guys for the house rockers over the past few years or over the years that have nodded their head when I go through the spiel with them. Yeah. And I should have had my BS detector on a little bit. They, they wanted the gig 
And I don't know whether it's intentional, probably not. I mean, one case, I know it was in, intentionally deceitful. He just wanted to get in and then he was going to, you know, pursue his own agenda. Sure. One sure. Guy, another guy, I believe he truly wanted the gig. And as it came in, you know, you know, he felt that he wanted something else. He, he really wanted to believe that, that he wanted to be a, to be in the band like this. Yeah. But, um, it just didn't work out, but the ability to decipher whether someone really is connecting and that's hard. Right? Oh, it, super hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and it, things change too, right? True. Like as, as, and as someone's, you know, as you've got a band where people are in it for, you know, five or 10 or 15, almost 20 years in your case, right? Like people's, I mean, pe we all change as humans, not, let alone, you know, we're in a band and Our situations. Yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I'm actually going through a, a similar thing with, with fling right now. And it it's, it's so easy to look and see the evolution of how this happened. Right. But uh, but now it's like, oh, crap, I didn't see it at the time. Now, how do I deal with it? And and the problem is uh, uh, balancing. Th there's a there's now a desire by by some for equaling the number of songs sung by each member, balancing that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, huh, that's interesting. And and what's happened is we've essentially that that part of it really has become a band in some ways, not in all the ways, but, but it, when you, when you dissect it down, it's not a band anymore. It's five people and it, you know, individually wanting five different things and equal representation or equal vocal representation. And that it, like, there's so many things about this that just don't make sense to me, even though I understand that they do make sense to other people. Like I'm respective of that. It just like, to me, it's, we're one band. We're not a band of five people. We are a band of one, right? We are fling and good news. Everyone plays on every song. The guitar mm -hmm. player plays on every song. The bass player plays on every song. The drummer plays on every song. You know what I mean? Like we all play on every song. So everybody's involved. We're one band and let's go not put out the best mini set of Dave's songs that Dave sings and then the mini set of songs that Russ sings or, you know, whatever. It's like, let's go put out the best of fling. And that's a very different thing. And that's what we always had done. And through time, you know, some folks were like, Oh, you know, like they bring a song in. It's like, Oh, okay. I want to sing. And now it's, well, I've brought a lot of songs in. So therefore there's enough songs I could sing an equal number of songs to everyone else in the set. It's like, well, that's true. But those songs, regardless of vocal ability, it's like, are those the best songs for this gig? Are those the best songs that Fling can put on stage in this particular scenario? And, um, and the answer well, is, let me, the answer let me, is let no. Me, let me <laughs> right? Yeah. So weigh these two things. Is, is that thing... That is the best of fling. If that ends up butt hurting somebody, yeah. is it still the best for fling? No, long term, it's not the best for fling. Or uh, is it? Or is it? Cause, right. Because it's the it's your best, right? That well, that's the thing. Is like <laughs> how how is what's best for fling in a two hour window? The, not also what's best for fling for every two hour window, right? Like why, why would this change? And, and, and I get it. Like, you know, I, I guess I, I don't get it, but I, I, in that it doesn't resonate with me, but I understand that for some folks singing lead vocals on a song is an important thing. Um, you know, like, when you want to feel like you get, that's because you want to feel like you're contributing creatively, but is playing the drums, not contributing. Like, you know, I like fling would, would suck without a drummer. It'd be really weird. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, is that, is that not contributing creatively? I always well, thought I'll, it was. I'll, I'll throw a twist to this buddy. So, um, cause I'm having trouble have wrapping my head around this, even though well, I understand that, that this is truly how people feel. Like I, I'm, I don't want to, negate anyone's feelings. I, I get that they're valid. I just don't grok it. And I don't well, think again, it's the best thing for the band. It it comes down to this thing about whether it's a, it's a financial enterprise and people are beholden to it because it's a job. 
Right. Which is not the case it, with this, right? It is an at will creative thing. And I, I always think that that kind of, when it's not money, yep. the argument of what's what represents the band better is so subjective in most cases. I mean, I guess it can be absolute in some cases. If you're a dance band, does your song get people up and dancing? Well, that that's does, the does thing. It's like, do, do these, what songs resonate with those? And so I, I've actually started thinking about this. Like, okay, here's a list. Like, number one, there's four things on the list. Number one, is the song instantly recognizable to to the crowd for a, you know for a party gig where the goal is to engage the crowd and have them up dancing is the song instantly recognizable that's like number 1 also like i'll call it number 2 but you could swip, switch this to be number 1 does the band play it really well does the song come across well cuz i could come up with a zillion tunes that people recognize that fling doesn't know or doesn't play well right so it's those two things have to be married together right recognizable and we play it well and and then it's is it danceable right and then number four is do people you know are, are the majority of the people going to be able to just sing along like do, do like do they know it that well sure and and i think that's probably covered with number one which is why i made that number four but that's it right and now let's pick those songs and that's it we're done all right so that's a, I, I, I think know I'm you kind of Well, but it's like you also kind of have an engineering straight line process thought to, you know, black and white. Does it measure here? Does it pass A, go to B? Does it, you know, that type of thing? Right. I'll, I'll give you a perspective when I, for example, write set lists for the house rockers. Yeah. Yeah. So please. I know I have a bunch of um, uh, things I need to satisfy in order because I will say this, the best thing for the house rockers is when the house rockers as a band feels it together. And so we, we can actually go down to <laughs> go down the list of your stuff. We can do a number five, you know, does the band, does the band play it well, even though people don't know it and does it get a response if the band is clicking. And one of the ways that yep. that happens is that, you know, we, we share the ball, you know, to use a sports metaphor, you know, people, you know, I make sure there's a spot in the show for all the horns to get at least one place to shine when writing the set list, you know, I have to keep in mind the flow of the show. I have to keep in mind the desire of all the singers in my band to get their yayas. And when everybody feels fulfilled, I think those are our best shows. I mean, we're never very far off. Yep. We're never very far off the beaten path with the songs. Like I said, you, you know, I've somewhat positioned the argument that we only get X amount of quote unquote vanity songs a night. Right. Right. Um, and then, you know, and I also in, in playing the long game, if your vanity song isn't, isn't played tonight, maybe it'll get played the next night and that type of thing. So, so it's a, it's a tough thing. And um, I have to look myself in the mirror all the time because it's not always, I, I think I've shared this with you. It's not always the show that I would want to play. If it was just me. Sure. Of course. But what makes the yes. house rockers more successful is when everybody gets to touch the ball uh, and, uh, and contribute that that's when there's no, you know, pouting on stage, you know, not that that, see that's pouting. to me, that's the, the thing though, is, is playing your instrument. Like the, the, every one of us in the band in fling is there because of the instrument we play, right? Like I play the drums, Burke plays bass. We get Mike and Russ on guitar and Aaron on, on keys. And yes, we all can sing. There are some people in the band who are much better singers than others. Uh, it, you know, but like is playing your instrument, not touching the ball enough. And I, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is it seems like for some, the answer is yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, in general, if you do sing, you want to sing and, and, um, I think that you go back up to that basic thing. If it's not a job where you're not doing it for, yeah. for compensation, you're doing it for fulfillment. Um, that concept of, of giving everybody ample time to shine. So I, I gave the example about one guy who, who I gave a gig to, even though I should have known better. This one guy, you know, I typically give people three songs and this was a guitar player, three songs to prepare, um, three different styles, uh, just to hear how they approach their tone and their preparation. And one of the songs is Rosalita. Okay. Because it, because it requires some skin in the game to prepare. You right? get, yeah. You're not going to just listen to that on the way over and, and exactly. Nail it. Yep. 
And the guy came to the rehearsal and he goes, uh, you know, I pretty much got the other two, but man, that one was really long. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't have time to prepare that for a one for a rehearsal. And that should have been the red flag and it should have been the end of things, but we had a lot of gigs coming up. We were kind of stressed about it. He was a good player, fine player. Um, but that was a, that was a bigger red flag than we gave it credit for at the time. Yep. And it turned out to be indicative of, of, you know, cause nobody else had that problem anyway. So, um, he got into the band and what he wanted was a lot more of a spotlight for him. So he wasn't even coming into the band with a, with a team attitude. He, right. he was coming into the band, like I'll get in and then I'll spread my influence. And, you know, especially in a leader led band, that's going to ca- cause problems. But I think in any band, like, you know, it's funny, Russ has been in my band for a year now. Yeah. And, you know, he still calls himself the new guy. I'm like, dude, you are not the new guy. You are. I mean, he is. In this. Well, he's and, the newest guy, but yeah. but his his vote counts just as much. He shouldn't hold back his opinion when it's a group discussion. Listen, he is not the day, worth less. The day Rush new. announced their retirement, Neil Peart was still the new guy. You know, 40 <laughs> years later, still the new guy. I'll tell Russ. Yeah. But, but you know, you get my point. It's like, I do. I, yeah. I, he's, you're in the band. Your, your opinion matters. Uh, vote your conscience, you know, contribute. You're in, we were chosen for the band because we feel you'll be a, you know, contributing voice to, you know, the things that we need to work through. And I think that that's the, that's, you know, I guess, you know, again, there's leader led bands. There's bands where it's me and a backing band and, you know, the expectations are set and, you know, that's good. But I think the cover band, semi-professional weekend warrior groove thing, I would say, Dave, you're, you're knowing you and you, you know, quite analytical, right? You're like, but you are contributing. You are, your hands are on the ball, every single song. I get your perspective on that, but I would, I would feed back to you. So here's, here's my, now you, you, I think you touched on where the issue is because you said you want to give everybody their time to shine. Right. And I I, like, I get that. But the problem is that there's a little bit of a disconnect between the definition of shine or in the definition of shine for some folks. Like I do, I want fling to shine, which means that each of us needs to shine our best at the moments that we can. The problem is when someone says, but I really want to play song X because I like singing it. It's like, yeah, but we don't shine. You don't shine when you do that. Therefore, we don't shine when you do that. Like, that's where the problem comes in for me is. Well, but there's a solve for that, Dave, right? I mean, tell them to find something that does shine. Oh, that's and, absolutely. Know, I think, I think but think saying like, yes. dude, we want you to have your time. You know, we want you to shine, but that's not the one. But that's, right? no, we've been, we can all talk very frankly that. about that. Yeah, no, we've had that frank conversation, but it just doesn't get solved. You know, mm, it's, that's uh, unfortunate. it's the, well, I don't want to sing a song like Mustang Sally. Well, okay. Find some else. Like find something else. <laughs> yeah. There's a million freaking songs out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it is tough being, I mean, it, we all are blind at some point, at some level, we're all blind to our, our, um, our inadequacies, right? You, you know, you, you, you have to just convince, especially if you're singing, right? You do or doing anything, taking a solo, whatever it is, something where the light is, you know, squarely shined on you. You have to deliver that with confidence, even if it's, it's fake confidence, right? For sure. Right. I mean, it's, that's, and so sometimes though, that fake confidence starts to become reality. And it's like, yeah, but like those people over there don't like, that's not the best thing to show them right now. Yeah. I think, and that's that's where the the band conversations come in again, when it's a leader led band, it's, it's one dynamic. And, you know, like, you know, your, your four or five benchmarks, are those everybody's four or five benchmarks? No, they might not be. Everybody. Right. Yeah. And if not, then you have that functional problem. That's not, that's right. not really that different from I don't want to go more than 20 miles from my house. For, no, that's, for a gig, that's why right? I brought it up, because it's clearly like I know that I know that I don't at least I don't think everybody has that same list. I think for for at least a few of the guys, the the thing at the top of the list is I want to get I want to sing five songs, you know, like that's number one. And then what's number two? OK, let's pick some songs that, you know, that people might know. Ooh. Okay, like that, that's where it's like, yeah, we're, we have a disconnect and it, yeah. it was an evolved disconnect, you, you know, is uh, this happens over a number of years and it's like, whoa. And it, it's interesting to see it sort of come up 
as we're preparing for a, a specific gig where it's it's like a fundraiser, there's going to be a ton of people there. And it's like, we need to put the best fling show we can on stage. And one of the guys was like, yeah, I just want to make sure I, you know, I get my five songs. Like, okay, mm -hmm. which five, which five? And, and, and this is kind of how I'm going to approach it in this scenario is I'm just going to say, look, here's how I built this list. Let's discuss it. Right. This is, I mean, we're, you know, everybody has an equal voice. So I, I've given us something to pick apart. We can destroy it if we want. It's fine. No problem. But what I would ask is as you're looking at this list, here's, you know, the 25 songs that we have to play that I've chosen for us to play at this gig. And then here's everything else that didn't make the cut, didn't make my cut. If you want to put something else on the list first, before you pick what you're putting on, pick what you're taking off. What song comes off? Because hopefully that might get us all thinking at least in the same direction. Like, okay, I would take this song off. Great. Okay. Why? Well, I don't like it. Okay. Like that's, that's a valid reason, but okay. But is it a good, like, can we acknowledge separate from our own personal desires? You know, is it a good one for us to play in front of that crowd or would it be a good one? Yes or no. Okay, fine. Take it off the list. Now what's going to go in its place? Cause we just took off a song that, you know, had at least some value for this particular gig. Let's put something in that also has that value or better. That's, that's, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not looking at it the right way, but. No, I think you are looking at it the right way. I just think whether you can convince other people to look at it that way is, is you know, again, <laughs> they're the either problem. on your page or they're not on your page. Right. Or you can just have a good productive discussion. And remember, mm -hmm. remember these things are often uh, uh, an exercise in compromise, right? Absolutely. So, you know, of course. One, per, one person's perception as to what is an, ex you know, and I don't think there's a band out there that doesn't go through this. No, I that's why I figured it was episode, a good one to talk about. Yeah. For sure. I think our very first episode, one of the first things we said was uh, being in a band, being a musician is an exercise in, in look how awesome I am, right? Look how, especially a cover band, totally. look at this amazing taste I have in music. I'm going to go find this hidden gem that is going to take you back to this yeah. magical place and, you know, uh, you open up the stars and, you know, all this type of stuff. Uh, it is. Um, and then you get back to yeah, how, clever. Play, how, you know, woman. how clever and, and is too clever. Yep. Yeah. And then how clever is too clever. That's true. And the, and the, it, the hard thing about clever is you often uh, don't get the satisfaction because your band doesn't get the cleverness of it. Right. You know, they kind of, you start out, you know, wanting to, you know, I'm all in, you know, I, I'm in, but then you get a kind of a lukewarm response to it. The first time you're like, you know, we knew this wasn't going to happen. And, and you kind of, you kind of like <laughs> cycle through this process of, of evaluating songs yeah. uh, in, in a cover situation. Again, in a, in a, in an original one, it's a way more interesting exploration, right? Yeah, because but it's the same conversation. It really, it, it like, it comes down the same thing. Like, do we deliver the song well? And if it's a new original, okay, well, obviously it's not going to be recognizable because it, no one has heard it before, but uh, does it have a hook? Is there something about it that's, you know, that, that, that we believe will hook people if we put it in the right spot in the set. I remember the first time we played um, an original, we've had maybe, I don't know, four years now, this tune that Russ wrote, Burke sings it, our bass player sings it. It's called the uh, Hamburg Station Blues. It's on our EP, so you can find it online, flingrocks.com. But um, the first time we played it, we opened a set with it. And man, it instantly had the dance floor full. And we're all wow. looking at each other like, well, <laughs> that there you go. We we kind of thought we'd put it at the beginning of the set to, you know, play it, but get it out of the way. So it didn't derail things later. I mean, mm -hmm. that was, you know, and it was like, no. OK, great. And and that has happened every time we've played that song. It's like perfect. It so, yeah, yeah, great. It's sold. Great. You know, but um, but so there has to be that kind of stuff. Like, is it a good song? Like that's that's step one. And then is it one that we play well, it, you know, and and at some gigs, like, so what know, do you guys do? Do you vote or does the guy who get the, who, you know, what does the guy who writes the set list do what he, you write the set list for fling, right? I do. Yeah. And so are you, are you all omnipotent and powerful when you do that? Or do you yeah. try to share the ball? Uh, no one else seems to really want the ball. And so that's sort of the other frustrating part is it's, you know, I, I get complaints about it, not complaints, suggestions, you know, constructive feedback, which I actually welcome. Like, I mean, I want us all to have buy-in on these things, but like, 
most of the guys would acknowledge that they don't think about like when we have these discussions and it's like, well, but you got to look at the big picture. Most of the time it comes out that, oh, yeah, I always forget. I never look at the big picture, you know, it's like, okay, cool. But Some people just don't think that way. Correct. And remember, when you shoot down someone's song, it's a really dicey thing, depending on how sensitive the person is, because you're shooting down their worldview. Right. And nobody likes to have their worldview shot down. Right. 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 No, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, But I I do think, again, I take the heat for the decisions I make as a leader. Yep. If it was a democracy and we were agree, we're like, you know, let's let's have our, you know, regularly scheduled evaluation of how we're doing on certain things. And that's that's the interesting thing. And fling set lists were not originally a democracy. They were written either by Russ or by me. And that's still largely true today, although I've I've it's mostly me. And they were never a democracy. And and it's like, and I, you know, if I ask somebody, especially if we're playing like a three set night, are there any tunes that, you know, don't automatically float up for me that you want to throw in there? Like, I'll find a place mm-hmm. to put them, that kind of thing. When it's a compressed, like, you know, one long set or whatever, I, th- there's no room for it's all killer, no filler. You know, it's like. So I, I can kind of bring this all the way around. So, sweet. so I asked you in the beginning is what's best for fling the material that's best for fling or is what's best for fling the buy-in of the band. And I will tell you that in my mind, um, people ask me, how have you kept the band together for 20 years? Yeah. I, I will make that compromise because the continuity and buy-in I think is the most powerful thing for the band at the expense of what I might know is a better song decision. Yep. But if a guy is really hot to sing a song, I, you know, hopefully he'll see himself right in my band, you know, that it's not quite working. Um, and you got to give it its due and you got to give it its chance. Um, and you know, I will seed my band with the philosophy of how I do, how I think about the set lists, you know, some degree, not too much because I don't want, you know, (laughs) quite frankly, I don't want too much feedback. You you don't don't want want one discussion. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I don't, I don't want it to become a communal discussion, but right, you, know, right. you have to kind of let the, let the rope out and yeah. let the band experience. I I'll say this, it would be a weird, now you have, you wouldn't be playing with these guys if they weren't all good guys. Correct. I don't think anybody would want to play a song when he feels that his band is not, you know, is not vibing with it because the audience isn't giving it back to them. I don't think anybody wants to push an agenda of a song that is purely their vanity. I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't play with guys like that. No, no, but I, and no one in fling, certainly that doesn't describe anyone in fling, but what I have seen happen in fling and in other bands is that people don't necessarily have the, the, the perspective on that, right? Like no one would outwardly say they want to do that, but their own priorities sort of blind them to even looking to see if that's happening. If that makes sense. Gotta, I think you just got to create that environment where they can be less blinded because yeah. the opposite of that is, is encouraging them to dig their heels in. Right. No, of course. And then that's worse. Right. Then yeah, nobody worse. wins. That's right. We yeah. had a song um, that true. someone brought in yeah. a while, quite a while ago. Thank called, you, by the way, this is great. Yeah, man. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's kind of my life on an everyday basis. It, it literally is the thing I think about more with the house rockers than anything else is how do I share the ball? Uphold a qualitative level that I can feel like good about going out and selling. Right. Yeah. So now, you know, what I was I'm up for like two hours down. last night thinking about this. Yeah. Okay. It is. It's, it's an emo, it's an emotional thing. Cause it's not, you can't just simply say, listen, you're paid to do this. No. Cause someone will say, no, I'm not, not yeah, enough, not, not, right? not enough. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So you right. know, if you want to guide, you know, first make sure it's not just your view. It's, you know, that you have band consensus on it. If it's just your view, then you're the one actually who has to kind of look in the mirror and decide whether you're happy or not and whether it's working for you or not. Sure. If everybody else is fine. Like whatever, whatever, yep. you know, that's, that's, you're not on the same page, which is our initial point. Someone brought a song in called Africano power, a earth, wind and fire song. Okay. Um, uh, it's an instrumental. It, um, you know, it's a great horn line. Um, hard, really hard, like sure. eating at the grown up table hard. It, uh, it struck me right away that it was just uh, the wrong vibe. And I, uh, was against it vocally. So this is maybe 10 years ago. I was vocally against it. The second someone played it for the band, like that's right. Sure. And as I watched the 
hurt and the person who brought it in um, feel like almost like he was being attacked, which wasn't what I was doing, but I could see now. That yeah, no, it, it wasn't your intention. You, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But it got read like that. And then that created a cascade of tension a, among the band. And the guy was, you know, strong communicator. And he was like, listen, can we just try it? Why would we shoot stuff down? And I was like, we shoot stuff down because I don't want to waste people's time for something that's not going to work. Sure. And so the, the, then we are up to level two. Of, I was going to say heels dug in. Yep. Now, now we're getting there, right? Yep. And, uh, and the level of tension. So then uh, really what I did was as a, as a leader, I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to let this play out to prove my point. Rather than, you know, me just saying I'm the hammer, which, you know, I could have done. I'm going to say, so, so we learned the song, played it a couple of times. You know, it is, it is a delicate and difficult horn chart. And, you know, it's earth, wind and fire for Christ's sakes, right? Yeah, right. It's, you know, it's like one of the world's great bands. And, um, and uh, we didn't sound exactly like that. And it didn't quite have that effect. And it was an instrumental, which are always kind of weird in a, in a, you know, show. It's like even for opening a festival show or something like that. You know, in some universes, it could have worked, I guess, but I, I kind of saw it. Right. But the lesson I kind of learned from that is. I would lean now toward let's try it. Uh, and and having that kind of can do attitude, no one dies, you know, nope. if one song you know doesn't go over in a night and, and it might be better for band harmony. So this is how I kind of bring it all the way around is like. You have the discussions about what good looks like. What do we want to be when we grow up? I think all bands have that all the time. And I think that, um, you know, I'm sensitive about asking my horn charting guys to spend time charting something if we're not going to get to it. Right. So I try and state that, like, come on in. But I, every year I find and I'm actually guilty of this, too. I, I'll find a song that is like, oh, well, this will be my vanity song. Right. And then all of a sudden we have seven vanity songs on the list for the year and we're spending too much time on vanity songs. Yep. Um, so. Uh, the band has to talk in regularly about what good looks like. How are we doing against good? You know, let's keep this in mind as we as we bring, you know, if we're all in agreement to this, let's keep this in mind as we bring stuff. If someone feels they can stretch good, you know, because it's something they really feel that they can, you know, it, it's outside the core of what your definition of good is. I think a can do attitude might service your band better. Good for band harmony. And that's really the thing I would hold up with you, Dave, is like what ultimately is best for your band, band harmony and everybody on the same page, meaning everybody's excited to come to work. Everybody's excited for every show or, you know, playing Mustang Sally. Right. Right. Well, nobody actually wants to play Mustang Sally. I actually don't but mind. You get playing my it. point. Yes, I do. I don't yes, mind playing it either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, th so we that can do attitude has always been a part of playing. It's it's you know we we will try anything because over the years we've actually learned. Uh, certainly, I've learned that the things you know someone will suggest a song and I think oh, you know you can hear my eyes roll right. <laughs> you know, it's like okay, but then we try it and it's like oh wait a minute wait 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 wait. Hang on. Like there's a, there's a nugget of something that just happened here. Let's dig in a little bit, you know, and then we play it. The problem is that like that nugget sometimes polishes up and turns into something wonderful. Right. And other times, you know, you you try it out, you play it live once or twice, you put a little polish on it and yup, it's still just a nugget. You know, it just it never went further than that initial spark. And then there's some things that we'll try and it's like, OK, not that ever again. You know, it's just obvious right away, whether it's worth spending a little time. But sometimes you spend a little time on something and realize, oh, OK, this this just like we did, We played it three times for a crowd. We weren't into it. The crowd wasn't into it. Like it falls off the list. Like to me, it seems like you don't even need to have that discussion. And then it will be. You know, three gigs later, hey, how come we're not playing song X anymore? I really like that. It's like, wait, were you like, were we not all on stage when that mess happened those three times in a row? You know what I mean? Like that, that kind of thing is where the frustration and the disconnect happens. It's like, well, wow, I, I thought it was obvious that that was a, that that nugget was actually a turd, you know, like, uh oh, but <laughs> it, the, but the reality is it's you that usually comes from a place of I really like, you know, my favorite band's version of that song. 
And when I play it, that's the version I hear in my head. And I want to, I want that, you know, I want to, I want to be part of that. Honestly, it's like, I want to, I want to play rock band, y- you know, I, I uh, like the Nintendo game or whatever. Like, it's cool to interact with your favorite songs. It's, it's a thing that, that is wonderful. And if you're not a musician, I highly rec and you, and you're still listening to the show. It means you're a fan of music. So I highly recommend getting rock band because it lets you experience some of that, right? Where you're, you're in your favorite song. Like mm-hmm. that's a cool thing to be able to do. Um, but that, you know, that, that's like the, the furthest extent of, of what you call vanity songs. Like, you know, I just want to do it so I can do it and play along with the song in my head. It's like, yeah, that, whoa. And I, and, and we've gotten a little bit of that happening in fling a little bit, you know, and it's like, we, we need to be honest about what it sounds like and what it looks like when we're performing this song for those people. And the way that you communicate your, uh, the way you communicate your interpretation of that honesty is really, really important. Again, yeah, like I've been in band conversations where they've been brutal. Yep. You're, you're out of tune on this. And, you know, you can see someone kind of shrink back because not everybody has the same, you know, social skills, communication skills. Yep. And there's the well, one and, guy who's like, we have to be, I'm just being honest. We have to, we have to just, you know, and brutal honesty isn't always the best tactic. Again, if your goal is to keep your band together, yeah, you know, it, it's more about coalescing everybody's style than it is the black and whites. The black and whites often can kill you. That's true. That's fair. That's true. Yep. Yep. Well, how come everybody can't read my mind, Paul? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there, man. <laughs> I've been friends with you for a long time. I, I don't even know when to turn left or turn right. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Your it's wife a tough is a thing. saint, by the way. Oh, I know. I'm aware of that. <laughs> that, that I, very much so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ain't that the truth? Uh, all right. Well, thank you. This is good. It's I, I, good I needed some of this uh, commiserating and also the perspective. So it was perfect. Um, All right. How about real quick? We promised everybody three. Yeah. Well, we promised everybody our Christmas list. Yeah. Also, we're skipping Christmas, by the way. We're not doing a show next week. Oh, but guess what, man? I sent you something I'd love for you to post. I have a great friend and a Gig Gab listener. His name is Jeff Cohen. He he did his own take on some classic rock songs and he turned them into Christmas songs. Okay. If you will, let's share that for next week because he did a great job. He works at at DigiDesign. He's a talented singer, great guitar player, talented engineer. He did a really good job on these things. They're really fun. We'll share them to our Facebook page. That's perfect, man. Please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Paul's Christmas list. I got three cool things. You ready? I uh, I think so. Hang on. Let me let me get ready for this. Okay, I'm ready. All right. First is a company called Kemper Amps, and Kemper has a product called the Profiler, which is it's a it's an all in one solution that is a multi effects processor, preamp, and power amp, all in one box, and okay. then you know really elegant of. Uh, foot pedal solution. Uh, one of the better guitar players in my area has one. He's always sounds great. And I didn't know this is what he was using. So I kind of dug into this. It's really cool. It's real expensive, but <laughs> it's, um, it's really, really a cool product. So my number one is the Kemper profiler solution. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I think my number one is that I need a new, I want to have a new pitch slap. Um, uh, that's the thing that I use for my acoustic gigs, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a cajon, but it's a where I've gotten it in a wearable f- format. They, they build this one. That's a tabletop cajon. It's about six inches tall. And, uh, and I can wear it on my body. If anybody has ever seen pictures of me playing acoustic, that's what I have. And I know that I'm at some point, the wood on this thing is going to dry out or I'm going to put my hand through it or something. And, uh, and I just want another one and they make them in different woods and stuff. So I like that's that's kind of on my radar is to to get something that's a little different, but still from like the, the, near as I can tell, they're the best on the planet at this. So I just want another something from them and, and I'll be Very happy. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. All right. Number two for me from Outlaw Effects up in Canada. They have a um, it's called their Nomad Rechargeable Powered Pedal, pedal Board. The pedal board itself is powered. Oh. You charge it. And so that's one, you know, less cord that you have to run out to external power. So you just literally, you charge the board. It holds 10 hours of charge at a time. If you forget to charge it, you of course can plug it in like a regular board, but um, it also takes one less source of noise out of your signal by not having to go out to AC power. Yeah. Um, 
And so uh, they have a couple different sizes of it and the effects just plug right into the board itself. The board itself is what's powered. And so that's pretty cool. Outlaw Effects Nomad Rechargeable Powered Pedal Board. Nomad. Oh, that's what a smart thing. Because it, oh, that's really smart, man. I yep. like it. Yeah. Uh, I've become, I, I, I played an acoustic gig on on Friday night with, uh, with Monkey Fist, with Maddie and Johnny. And Matt, borrowed someone's turbo sound ip2000 it's one of these tower things yeah. but um man that ip2000 is really like i think two of those would work as mains for a lot of rock band scenarios and yeah. one of them works great for acoustic and they're only so, like 750 bucks right now yeah so i've we did an episode where I swore by my Bose one and yeah. I still love my Bose one, but it is, you know, two grand of investment for, you know, kind of a fairly, not even the top end of their, of their solutions. Right. Um, but a lot of companies have gotten into them and the turbo sound one is really, really, really good. I've heard that one as, as well. Uh, yeah. It, I was blown away by how easy it was to get a good sound out of it. You know, we ran a mixer into it. It had, it has two inputs, you know, but we, we just ran a mixer cause we're used to that, but Man, it's um, easy to set up and the tower part of it breaks in two. So mm -hmm. it's really compact, even though you've got this, I think it's got a 12 inch sub in the bottom and then, and then, uh, and you know, and then the tower that, that kind of goes up from that. They've got a 3000, which has two subs in it, two 12s in it, but that thing's like 1500 bucks. I, I think right. you'd be better off with two of the, the IP 2000s if you need that much sound and that way you can spread them and aim them and all that stuff. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Really impressed. All right. Number three for me, I love um, little accessories that make my life easier as a guitar player. Um, I love, I love great creative straps. I love, you know, all sorts of cl clever gadgety things. Sometimes I think it's just something to spend money on between gigs because you're just, you're so, you know, <laughs> if, if you're not playing, at least you can be thinking about playing. And, and uh, so I'm always looking for cool things that make my uh, performing life easier. Um, uh, Gator Cases, which is a really well-known company, they have a rack-style case that's kind of almost like a a road, uh, a touring uh, quality um, construction that holds six guitars um, and folds down into a really easy case. The problem with the ones that are just the racks is that you know they they're usually not that heavy duty, and if you you know gig a lot, even if you take care of them, you know just the opening and closing them over time yep. is going to the wear is just going to make them go. This is this is this is gig quality touring quality uh and it looks really cool uh and it's really sturdy so it'll take good care of your guitars which is really important uh and it looks cool and you can put it right on stage and it'll look cool on stage so functional and uh and aesthetically pleasing the rack style uh uh gator case six guitar stand that folds into a case gtrstd6 is my third wish from oh, rock and roll santa that's pretty good yeah, I like that. Man, I have uh I have a gator bag that I put all my hardware in and one of the stitches I've had it for I don't know, 8 years or something. And one of the stitches on one of the the outside little pouches came off. I called them up and they're like, "Yeah, okay, what's your address?" I'm like, oh, "Okay." And I gave them my address and 3 days later a whole new bag arrived. Like wow. their their guarantee is fantastic there. Yep. So I still use it. I'm like, do you want this old one back? Like it's, it actually still works. It's just the stitching. They're like, nope, you're fine. So we use one of them for mic stands and I use the other for, uh, for my drum gear. But, You'd love to hear about a company that takes care of their customers. Like I know. That, Cause that's really how it should be. Right. Yeah, totally. You're spending I mean, a lot of money your on this stuff. Your warranty is your warranty. You yep. do spend a lot of money on this stuff. Yep. All right. Yep. For number sure. three. I need a new, I want, I don't need any of this stuff, Paul. Let's be perfectly <laughs> honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, but that said, I need a new crash symbol. Like I, I'm, I need to add a different color and I, I have this pasty, it's a dimensions, um, 14 inch crash that I love, but they don't make them anymore. Uh, so I either need to find, and I want something to complement that. So maybe a, like a 15 or a 16 like that, their signature line is pretty good. Um, so that might be the thing to match it, but I, I'm on it. I'm on kind of a quest now is really what it, what it has become, uh, to find something that matches this. It's really interesting. I, I never liked pasty symbols and I think it's cause they were always too bright for me. You know, like the, the bottom, the, the 2002s or whatever they were like, those were just uh, like, I never liked playing them. I always liked the sound of them, but I never liked playing them. And then I hit this dimensions crash in a store, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. And a guitar player on the other side of the room 
like perked up guy. I didn't even know. Like I'd never met him. He's like, what was that? And it was like, yeah, okay, right. I like this. One. You know, it's like, yeah. So I'm pissing he, off guitar players. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? Yeah. No, he liked it. He, <laughs> yeah. He liked it. It was good. It was like, okay, good. Yeah. 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 So, so anyway, so there you go. That's uh, I need, I need a new crash symbol, something in that 15 to 16 size that, might fit in that color palette. So mm -hmm. I don't know what that's going to be, man. It's crazy. Symbols are a crazy thing, man. It's, um, they're a very personal thing. So I'm sure. Yeah. Like anything, you know, yeah. Your sound. Yeah. 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 You're hitting them with your, I mean, it's like a guitar. You got to play it. Yeah. You got to feel it. You got to see how it reacts to the way you touch it. Right. Cause the, the, we all touch our instruments differently. And so that's, yeah, that's really it's in the hands. It's in the hand. Part of it is. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. That's what all I right, got. Dave. Yeah, man. I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas and, and all of the Hamiltons who I love so much. Just you guys have a great holiday. Thanks, I man. want to wish all of our listeners. I want to wish all the sound people, all the roadies, all the booking people, and especially all the great musicians that uh, send in nice notes and listen to us. Wishing everybody a happy holiday. Yeah. It's tis the season. Thanks everybody for listening. All that stuff. We got one more show that we'll get to you before the end of the year. So we'll, we'll save the final wish for that one. But uh, yeah, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everybody. And to you too, Paul. It's been a, Take care, uh, it's a fun year. Yeah. Have a good one, everybody. Always be hey, performing. Even on the week off, always be performing. <laughs>